people do have comments. Um, you can just drop them in the chat, or if you say you want to say something at the end, just jump in uh, and we'll take it from there. Okay, great. Thank you, Hugh, and thanks, Steph and Owen and Alice um, for inviting me to this. Um, so yes, just to reiterate, um, I'm going to talk about a monument on the fringes of Rome and also its wider context. So this is the kind of a personal account rather than a scholarly account of part of the city that made an impression on me. Um, I suppose um, this, these, this part of the city, this context has a very particular quality, which isn't always that easy to share visually. So I will be as graphic as in my descriptions um, as I can be without rambling on and on. Um, I don't really pretend to know Rome well at all. And just like Chris Boyle described in his piece last week on books and how his memory of certain prose is redacted, my recollection of Rome and most cities, in fact, is wholly imagined. And every time I return to a place that I think I know in great detail, um, it's always different. Perhaps it has actually changed physically, um, but it is more likely that I have conjured up an image of it, which is false. And then there is always the consternation that it isn't exactly how you remember it, but equally there's the fresh, freshness and excitement um, of something different. Um, a bit like a goldfish swimming around in a bowl, always encountering something new. The first time I visited Rome, I was sure I had been there before, in another life maybe. The barrage of imagery gleaned from maps and history, from cinema, photography, from anecdotes, was imprinted so firmly in my consciousness, I was convinced I had experienced it before. And now every time I return to the city, it becomes clearer and clearer that in truth, I don't know it at all, or at least less and less. And it's a kind of um, inversion of, of knowledge. I was reading Jan Morris's obituary over the weekend and was reminded of her approach to visiting cities. Um, and she describes it as, quote, to run around the city like a mad dog, sniffing for vital trivia. The first place I visit are the law courts, then the markets, and then the railway station, unquote. So the part of the city of Rome that um, interests me is also the part that includes the railway station. It's the least, le less, less popular, um, long eastern slice um, of central Rome. And it, and it includes Termini, the station at its heart. Um, it runs from north to south along the Aurelian Wall from Porta Pia to Porta Maggiore, where the desired monument, the archaeological lodestone that I want to talk about at the end, is uh, situated. And, and this part of the city um, intrigues me mainly because of the nature of the wall itself and the different urban conditions that it forces on either side of it. Um, and the changes that it makes, or not, as, as, as the case may be. So I won't go into too much detail on this whole zone, as it's a very large swathe of land, but I will touch on some aspects of its character. So moving from the top to the bottom, at, at Porta Pia, Basil Spencer's British Embassy does its thing, inscribing a new castellated skyline in concrete rather than in travertine, and setting the scene for an almost silent bureaucratic streetscape, a protracted kind of diverse grid iron plan whose character slowly becomes more local, more noisy and more pungent as one gets closer to the railway station. This area near the railway station is the unloved hotel district where Rome begins to look like any other Italian city rather than its antique self in a dense matrix of 19th and early 20th century blocks, our gaze is constantly pulled down the deeply channeled stonework of back-to-back -back hotels and interrupted by parking lots and old-fashioned hair salons and the remnants of a bygone era, specifically the 1970s, and places such as the cinema Ambascatiori, which has achieved cult status as one of the last adult movie theaters still operating in Italy. So once the tourists have piled into their buses or trundled off into the hot city, these streets kick into action, becoming a crisscross space of delivery, production, disposal, of buying and selling and shouting, all enveloped in the warm fragrance of lunch being prepared in vast cauldrons and ovens, in kitchens, in tiny courtyards dotted across the blocks. And all the while, as we look back towards the sun, we're constantly reminded of the endless length of Termini below us, closing the vistas on every avenue. 
So the old Eastern Wall, this is Nolly's map of Rome, um, follows the, the city um, in that sort of diagonal trajectory. Its embrace is loosened now by the railway tracks emanated from the station, which make a rare breach in the rampart walls and cutting a swathe along Escalino, just the Escalino district as far as Porta Maggiore, where at that point they divide dramatically now, heading out towards the northern and eastern regions of Lazio. Something happens when a wall in, is introduced to, into a city grid. This is a singular kind of urban condition where attention is created by the intervention of enclosure, creating a kind of liminal space and where there is a heightened awareness of the space as a threshold between two distinctive worlds. In Berlin, for example, the wall was a modern intervention inscribed on the plan of a city still teetering from the shock of war. Sometimes it enclosed wasteland or ran along the edge of a waterway and sometimes it cut across living, breathing streets. Its scale and height was uniform, but at street level, it was a fortress. And from the balconies and high windows, the ambiguous other city could be glimpsed on the other side. At Porta Maggiore in Rome, the opposite is true. The city blocks grew outwards, consuming gardens and orchards to meet the wall and eventually spill out beyond it. The leftover spaces here are just as intriguing. In the blazing Roman sunlight, they exist in a kind of penumbra, but they depend also on the thinness and thickness of the enclosure and its various caesura. Scale and height changes here too, mostly almost equal in measure to the tall blocks of housing built like barricades along this aqueduct route and forming a constant backdrop like a Chirico painting. Beyond the ancient heart of the city and the tourist spots and the party spots, Rome becomes dilapidated very quickly with overgrown tumble down spaces and fading patinas, a kind of contemporary ruin, revealing Italy's impoverished crumbling state. This is true of the Porta Maggiore, which is formed in a kind of visceral collision of the Aurelian Wall, the Claudian Aqueduct, the Augustian Gateway, two ancient routes into the city, crisscross tram lines and laterally bound to the east by the diagonal railway. So this is another kind of liminal space. This one is of transition and of crossing over, producing chaotic change in urban form and space on all sides of what is essentially a gigantic roundabout. Peter Lang, one of the founders of the urban research group Stalker, called Porta Maggiore the umbilico di Roma, the belly button of Rome. In fairness, it's a pretty good description. A lot of the fluff from the city ends up here. He describes it as this an incongruent collection of historical detritus, the bringing together of artifacts and fauna from the farthest corners of this hemisphere. Scattered in no particular order are street lamps, train tracks, tram lines, electric power lines, abandoned cars, trash, park food trucks, rag markets, fenced off corners, broken benches and lead pipes. If you consider the living within this degraded ecosystem, you can count on Pigeons, foxes, cats, stray dogs and rats, as well as humans, the rushing commuters, the homeless tucked under overgrown hedges, maintenance men, sex workers, garbage pickers and out of town thrill seekers. But you can still sense when the Carthaginians faced the Romans, when proletariat freedmen built tombs of great magnificence, factory workers marched in protest and squatters occupied the very same industrial spaces not long after. You might still catch the spectre of Paolo Pasolini, turning on his heels, pacing through the arches on his way to one of his many haunts around the Mandroni. So, unquote. The squats that Lang mentions are pretty normal in Italy and particularly in Rome. One very large and very successful squat close to the square is the Spin Time Labs. This was the conversion of the former National Institute of Social Security and Public Assistance, ironically, into a commune with offices turned into small apartment units with shared facilities, the double height ground floor into workshops and an event venue with a nightclub in the basement. And I suppose the creation really here of a perfect people's palace. In his text, Peter also referred to when the proletarian freedman built tombs of great magnificence. This is a reference to the monument I went 
in search of. The mausoleum Urusake is built to honor himself and his wife, Atistia. Also known as the Baker's Tomb, it dates from the time of Augustus in the first century BC. When I saw this monument, I thought, well, this was a choice move to stick this homage so close to and on access with one of the most important entrances into the city of Rome. But of course, it wasn't really like that at all. The tomb had stood for at least 100 years before the gate and the aqueducts were construct constructed themselves. And then the arched set piece was slid behind the grave. So I should explain there are two distinct wall systems sort of necklaces around the city. The earlier one was the Servian walls. They were closer to the heart of the city and it was forbidden to have burial grounds inside these walls. Urusaki's tomb was well beyond these walls and there would have been other funerary monuments alongside his. However, his position is still very strategic as he had chosen the exact spot where two major routes converge. So the second wall system was then built by Aurelius in the third century and it incorporated the existing aqueducts and then this triumphal gateway which connected them. At first glance we don't see the tomb immediately, immediately from the piazza at all as our focus is on the travertine backdrop behind it but the distance between it and the gate is just about enough to allow for a kind of parallax as the tomb remains in focus while the gate moves this is partly to do with the fact that the tomb is tra trapezoidal um, and it distorts our perspective. It gained this footprint form from the angle of two routes converging on the city. The truncation of the eastern facade, um, so you can see the eastern facade here on the right hand side, and the loss of the roof canopy came about when it was assumed into a tower during a kind of outcropping of that wall in the medieval period. It was uncovered and restored by Pope Gregory XVI in 1838, when works were undertaken to reinstate the Augustian Gate. The whole ground level of the city has raised up over and over since the first century, so the lower story or, or shaft of the monument is almost entirely submerged in the current day level, ground level. Urasakis was a former slave whose once um, so once his freedom was, was obtained, he undertook baking as a profession. And the inscriptions wrapping around each side of the tomb tell us he was not only a master baker, but also a merchant who made a fortune selling bread to the Roman army. Clever guy, very clever. So during the 19th century excavations, the crew discovered inscriptions and sculptural elements that had been submerged. So usually uh, Roman funerary monuments contain portrait reliefs of the deceased family, but it was discovered that the baker had commissioned a full length marble relief portrait of himself and his wife, expertly carved, wearing highly draped traditional Roman garb of the tunic and the toga, in a very similar likeness to Augustus and his wife Livia. Here the baker couple assume nobility status imprinted in stone and aspire to join the company of gods. The monument itself still amazes this house of the dead. What, like, what was he thinking? The first time I saw a photograph of this was in Howard Colvin's Architecture and the Afterlife, where it is represented without any context or human scale. At a glance, it seems gigantic. The smooth travertine looked like fair face concrete and the cylinders without capitals or footings, without fluting or intasis, appeared like vast functional grain silos. The whole thing is remarkably modern and kind of sublime. There are a multitude of references here to grain measures, kneading container, containers, ovens, as, very, as well as a very literal description at the very top in the frieze of the process and craft of baking. Its prescience is really remarkable and obvious imagery is conjured up and questions about the impact it might have had on those who wandered through those gates and were met with the audacity of these pop art facades, its clarity and its functionalism. These aspects have already been hotly discussed at an outdoor second year staff meeting in Venice, where the long standing tutor at UCD, Jerry Cal, mused on its influence in one of his well known table set drawings which I doubt he will mind if I share this with you here. So you can see his drawing here on the left hand side and lots of comments about who might have seen it and who might have um, been inspired by it. So who did see it? 
did he see it? I'm sure she saw it. And did he see it? And what did he think? Urasaki's tenacity lives on in the very survival of that monument, as well as celebrating industry and capital. It embodies freedom and optimism, and most of all, the use of unconventional form and geometries. But it was a very clear visual strategy for the baker to memorialize himself. In a neat twist of fate, the pasta manufacturers Pantanella bought a vacant plot directly opposite the baker's tomb on the eastern side of the square and in the early 20th century built a vast factory and mill bookended by a very typical southern European tripartite grain silo designed by the engineer Alberto Naldini and the architect Pietro Aschieri. It makes a very literal gesture to Urasaki's in its oculi openings, the circular windows, which you can see on the long side here to the right of the photo. It has been recently converted to a mix of living and commercial units, and it is known as Ex Pastifico Pantanella, and it is one of the many industrial reuses on the periphery of the city. Okay, so that's it. Um, so I'll stop sharing. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm back. Yeah. That was great. Um, very polished. <laughs> but I, I, must, I must remember never to trust you when you say, oh, I'm just making a few notes. Don't worry. A few notes. <laughs> uh, so that was a seamlessly uh, and beautifully put together, um, I suppose, evocation of a particular part of Rome. Could you, you mentioned your, your research, and I mean, it felt like you, this was, is this a place that you've been to a lot or just once or is it a, um, so interactions with it? Um, to be honest, I haven't visited it often, no, po possibly only twice, to be honest. Um, I, I suppose it's one of those images that achieves a certain kind of status beyond its sort of physical reality in many ways. The first time I saw the photograph, I kept it in my mind and made it a a sort of a mission or pursuit to, to visit the, the, the building. And the second time I went to visit it, everything had changed around it. So it felt very fresh and very exciting, but the, the monument itself, I suppose it's one that it would associate with my own interest in, in industrial heritage. But beyond that, my interest also in, in peripheries of, of cities and sort of slightly, not necessarily forgotten spaces, but perhaps unloved spaces, that aren't, you know, they're often described as ordinary, but actually they're not ordinary, they're very extraordinary. So as soon as we use these spaces um, and live in them or work in them or, or whatever way we use them, they become less ordinary immediately. And um, it continues, um, I suppose, a sense of the, the industry and the city, which is the kind of combination that I'm always intrigued by. And um, just coincidentally, um, I'm supervising a, a a uh, fifth year um, dissertation this year, um, Nigel Flanagan, he's looking at industrial state, estates in, in, in Dublin, which is an area that also intrigues me. And it's one of these, these spaces, I suppose, that um, is starting to be eroded, is starting to disappear. There's sort of a sense in some of those spaces that they are becoming ruined already, even though they were only built in the 80s mm -hmm. and kind of Sort of yeah, contemporary ruin that that I'm that I'm interested in. So there's a there is a trajectory there, yes. But this image of of of, of the baker's tomb and the self indulgence of it, um, yeah. is, it has always I suppose remained with me. Yes. Mm. Uh, that's very interesting about that. Uh, we'll have to have a future one about the industrial estates of Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> Not <laughs> <can do> it. <laughs> there's so many of them, and they're just so like I was. I just immediately think of Sandyford actually is. Yeah. A kind of exemplar of that world but then also this i'm just interested in your alighting on those kind of li you use the word liminal a few times or these kind of slightly bit, like parts of a city that don't quite conform with the image of the city itself and how yeah how, how those persist if you like or how they're necessary actually to the <laughs> to the bit of the city that does conform with the image you have they, to have one to have the other I mean, yes, that... absolutely. Yeah, they they they're usually transitionary spaces as well. Um, so they they tend to be sort of, I don't know, transport hubs, if you like, or spaces that that haven't been entirely sort of neatly planned. And I think in cities where there is 
um, an imprint of an enclosure or a wall, as I said. Um, there, it's not like the medieval planned towns, you know, I suppose in Ireland you could think of places like Bandon or Derry where the, the town is, is planned alongside the wall and they're sort of knitted into each other. These are other spaces that, that are impacted by um, an intervention. And sometimes that intervention goes, it, 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 it raises in time or it's removed. And sometimes you're left then with this liminal space. But I'm interested in what happens on either side of that. So if we look at Rome, if, if we look at Porto Pia and the British Embassy, um, it's a very, very tight space. Um, when you move through it, you don't even really notice when you move through the gate, the difference between one side and the other. Whereas when you start moving along Termini and all the way down to Porto Maggiore, everything sort of changes. And it's, it's almost like the sort of secret garden effect. You know, there's something beyond it that I need to see, I need to get through. And it's that tension that's really exciting. And liminal spaces create that, I suppose, to a degree. It just, I mean, I should just say, if people do have questions or comments for Olivia, if you want to just either raise hand or drop, it, drop something into the chat, um, because we're going to keep her um, on the spot for another five minutes or so. Um, sorry, Livia. Well, Raise no, I, I, I was very careful just to make this 20 minutes, you so that you would have centre stage with your... Um... I don't know. It's, in fact, it's Jason has got a question for you. So, Jason, do you oh, want to right, okay. can we on mute, Jason? I think we can. I think I'm on mute, Hugh. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear I you. I can hear you, yeah. Yeah, great. And uh, <clears throat> I have to apologise there. Uh, my, my daughter got my got hold of my my Zoom a, a application over the weekend, so the uh, the stack of pancakes is yeah, not me. I think that's good. I like the stack. <laughs> thanks. Uh, they, they, they taste so good too. Um, but no, Olivia, thanks so much for the presentation. It was really interesting. It is a really interesting part of Rome. Uh, I spent two weeks there in my final year on that street uh, where there are uh, hotels, restaurants, bars. Um, so it's it's kind of fascinating area. As, as part of the industrial heritage, the, the other one that kind of occurred to me, the other site uh, that occurred to me was really interesting actually, was the, the Peroni site, the brewery site, which is behind Germany, because it's, the, uh, it's, the, it's where the Allies first bombed Rome. Uh, it was the first sort of bomb site, uh, you know, within the sort of city. Uh, it's a kind of, you know, it's a kind of quite, quite sort of pronounced in its, uh, I suppose, industrial, archaeological sort of heritage. Have you looked at that at all? Um, I, I haven't looked at it in, in great detail, but I am aware of it, yes. Um, um, it, just, I, I, it was one of the, the last trip I made to Rome. Um, I tried to see as much as I could of it. Hi, Jason, I can see you now. <laughs> um, I'm actually, for my PhD, I'm actually looking at um, the production of alcohol in the city and brewery in Ireland, so the, the, the 19th century city and, and the space of production. So I did try to get to see Peroni, but the place that I was very curious to see was, which was a little bit disappointing, you're probably familiar with it, it's, um, it's on the other side of the, the city, down near, to the south of um, Testaccio, um, mm -hmm. so below mm -hmm. the slaughterhouse. There's yep. a power station which has been converted um, and they use it to make molds for statues. You've probably, you're probably familiar with it. I know, I know, there's, a, I know there's, there's a mold mountain down there, is that right? Yeah, that's the statue, <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, below there's a slaughterhouse area which has been mm. slowly converted into um, an art event space, a little bit like the Matadero in, in Madrid. But to the south of that, again, there's a power station which is not unsimilar at all to the Pigeon House in Dublin. Um, and um, they use it for uh, restoration of uh, Roman statues and they're making uh, new molds and cons you know, conservation projects there. So there's this sort of um, interesting sort of set pieces. You can move through it, it's kind of like a museum and there's large sort of turbine halls and then there's rows of Roman statues sort of placed in this area. And I, I went there specifically because I wanted to see it as a power station and, and what they, the conversion that they had done. But it's yeah. interesting what you mentioned about the Allies bombing that area because um, there's wonderful imagery which you've probably seen of a lot of those streets 
in almost in rubble, you know, behind yeah. Termini and nice. huge blocks taken out. Mm -hmm. Actually, that cinema um, was rebuilt um, in the in the early twentieth century. Um, it's I think it's a fascinating area because the grid was already there on the Nolly plan, so it was already being planned in the eighteenth century, and then it sort of became protracted, and it's it's created this very dense kind of hot spot in the city that's um, that's interesting because when you have a city that has a hotel district, a very specific hotels district, it has a very um, interesting kind of character. You know, there's hotels scattered around the city, yes, obviously. Of course. It's like New York or, or parts of Paris where we don't really have that in Dublin, unless you could call maybe Gardner Street <laughs> the hotel. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you, you were also keen on that area because it's... Yeah. it's yeah. yeah, well, I did the other area that you're talking about, Testaccio, is where I did my final year thesis project actually, just on the other, the other side of the Tiber. So oh, right. we, we went to the slaughterhouses at, uh, at two o'clock in the morning looking for a squat party. So we, we, we kind of went along the river uh, extensively at night, and it is sort of it's a fascinating area. Uh, as well, as yes, well. It is. but it, it, is, it is because it's the, it, the the whole area from the the Protestants of cemetery, I guess, uh, which was originally yes. outside the wall, kind of mm. down to Testaccio in that area is is is, is really interesting. There's, oh, Alice was saying. Thanks, Jason. Thanks. Thank you. We enjoyed it. The original. Yeah, Alice is noting the importance of the archival importance, I guess, of the Jerry Cattle. Uh, original. Yes. That, that's Record, yeah. great to see. Anyone who's been on trips with Jerry will know um, all about that. Um, I, I just had one uh, final question, Livia, which is about I was just I, I thought, which is maybe about whether these spaces, these urban spaces, are. And as, it was as Jason was mentioning, looking for a squat party. You sort of think that maybe those spaces in the contemporary city are are tending to be harder and harder to find. That there are is there a point at which they get fully absorbed just into the mainstream. I mean, I'm thinking of Manhattan, say, for instance, where there really are not any more from, well, you would think there are no more frontiers, there are no more margins, you know, that is all, it's all been absorbed. London, you might say the same. Yeah, I think it, it kind of depends on the... Manhattan, some don't, or whether some urban form actually helps to resist that. I think capital is the issue there in some cases and um, politics as well. Um, I, Italy is, um, has a very healthy squat and commune culture and it's amazing how close to the city centre you will find these spaces and, and they're quite successful in their, um, in their formations as well. Um, I, I mean, th we, this is a kind of a gentrification topic in some ways too, and that comes down to land value and money. Um, I'm, I don't really know how it works in, in Rome, but um, the, 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 it's, it's normal. A squat is much more normal, more normal than it would be in Berlin these days, to be honest, um, until, until, until it becomes not normal. Um, but that, that instance that I showed you of the spin time labs, that's a, a success story in its, in, its, in its physical conversion as well. And it's, I suppose, relevant when we think about our Apollo house in Dublin and the fact that that, that failed um, to a degree, whereas the, the communal living is something that, that's very accepted um, in Italy and therefore it prevails. Um, but no, I mean, to answer your question, Hugh, I think it's it's really about land value and capital. Is it, I mean, if Mark Price is here, he might have a further comment on that, and he probably knows more about it than I do. Um, but that's yeah, that's awesome. what it. No, okay. Hi, Mark. <laughs> Wait till you hear what I'm going to talk about, Mark. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I think we'll. Uh, thank you very much, Livia. Uh, well, thank you very much, Livia, on the one hand, but on the other hand, you know, uh, I, I did have an exchange with Livia yesterday where she said, oh, I'm just making a couple of notes. I'll just make a couple of notes. Um, if I, I didn't make notes, I think, yeah. I think if I didn't make notes, it, I'd be still talking, as most of the second wow. year students would know, and I don't want to go on and on and on. So I was very aware of time. So, yeah, well, good luck to you. <laughs> so now... I have no notes. Uh, I have just pictures and 
Um, I, if if I can just now share a screen, um, I might just start. So um, I suppose my, the premise of this very very uh, loose um, talk is is I suppose this this what sometimes happens if you're if you if you visit places or if you go on short trips, and and you find yourself um, presented with an opportunity to visit some to visit in this case a building or in these two cases buildings that ha weren't really on your radar, so you had no real expectations about them, and in different ways they actually. Um, well, I suppose easily exceed that relative lack of expectation um, and start to open up all kinds of interesting um, uh, questions. And there's somehow you, I think partly by virtue of being away and being on quite an intense sort of trip, you can respond to them in very um, vivid and uh, sometimes kind of quite emotional ways. Um, and I suppose this was the case with these two uh, projects that I'm just going to talk about for the next uh, 20 minutes or so. The first is uh, in this place that we see on this nighttime satellite image here, which is Abu Dhabi, the southernmost of the uh, United Arab Emirates. I um, visited, so if you can see from the north, you've got Dubai. Uh, up above that is the Emirate. There's seven Emirates. The, the, the one above Dubai is called Sharjah, which is where I visited to, to go to a conference a couple of years ago now. Uh, and just just took the opportunity for well, I was only there for a few days uh, to visit also Dubai, and then there was an opportunity uh, to make a bus trip down to Abu Dhabi, um, particularly to see uh, the building I'm going to talk about. But of course, uh, just to, I mean, everybody knows, and I'm not going to go into detail here about the UAE and the way it's set up. These that each of them, they're basically autocracies or sheikdoms. Each of the Emirates is run by a sheikh, um, who basically, it effectively bankrolls the entire um, development, the entire city and its, and its region. Um, and the bankrolling is done on the basis of um, the oil industry, I guess, at the moment. Um, previous to that, it would have been the pearling industry. And after oil, I guess the question is what comes next. But at the moment, these, these emirates, particularly Dubai, are going through this phenomenal phase of development. And the development is, for the most part, kind of pretty scarifying uh, and not very edifying, you might say. Uh, large, large, large towers, the largest of them obviously being the Burj Al Khalif, which you can see in the distance there. Um, so a model of uh, building at large scale, building at great height, building uh, artificially um, climate controlled environments, huge ground scraping malls tend to kind of accompany these uh, tall buildings in, in the middle of Dubai. Um, for Olivia's per personal edification, I'm including here an image of our mutual friend, John Montague, um, as he's about to embark on the virtual reality Tom Cruise experience that you can take on the top of the Burj Al Khalif. Um, I'm not showing the image of me doing it, uh, but that came next. But as I say, um, the opportunity then arose to kind of go down through the Emirates to Abu Dhabi uh, to visit um, a new museum there, the new Louvre. Uh, in Abu Dhabi. And, and on that journey, I guess you see part of the sort of hinterland of the Emirates. I mean, I'm not really showing the images here, but you see the oil production and the oil refinery, but you also see all the sort of sort of service housing, the housing where the, the population of the Emirates, 17% of the population are Emiratis. In other words, 17% have permanent residency status. The rest are basically there to do jobs. And if they don't have a job, if they run out of a job, they have to leave after six months. So you get this huge proportion um, of, I guess my, you could call it migrant labor. Now, a lot of them are highly paid um, workers, but then there's a huge population that of course is, is the migrant labor that sustains all of the kind of service industries um, and all of the sort of sparkling um, <coughs> spectacle um, of cities uh, like Dubai. It's also a Muslim um, country. He, I mean, he, he, yeah, overwhelmingly Muslim. And one of the other places we visited was this, which is this brand new and pretty hideous, it must be said, uh, mosque. Sorry, that's the wrong word, but <laughs> uh, um, which is the second largest in the world or something. So it's full of these, these, these very, very grandiose um, kind of developments. And, and there's many, many, many more slated uh, to happen, particularly um, down in Abu Dhabi, which is probably the fastest growing 
um, of the Emirates and uh, um, following, if you like, the development of Dubai, but now particularly the kind of islands that are, um, you know, you can see these kind of flat, uninhabited pieces of land um, at the edge of the Gulf. A lot of these, and there's one in particular, and I'm sorry the name slipped my mind, that has become the focus for a whole kind of zoo, if you like, of architectural developments. This is where the Guggenheim was going to go with Frank Gehry for a while. Um, and there was this big Zaha Deed project. There was a whole lot of projects that were supposed to go onto this island that you're seeing in this image here, which is going to become this kind of cultural uh, quarter. The first project, and maybe in fact the only project that's going to be built out of all that is the project that I wanted to talk about. I was only going to show my own photographs, so then I thought now I'd better show a few uh, drawings and images of it. Um, so this is Jean Nouvel's uh, Louvre Abu Dhabi. Um, and I guess it was interesting to me because uh, the, the night before we visited this um, at the conference, there was a talk from a local big wig architect um, who, who basically escoriated the, the new Louvre, possibly, you know, not very surprisingly, um, on, on, on the basis that it was, it was just mimicking without any depth, some, some sort of local forms, um, Arabic patterns, and, and particularly the kind of urban form of the Medina. And um, I, I mean, I thought that sounded kind of convincing and I was fully expecting not to be very taken uh, by this project when I visited. But in fact, I, I think um, there's something to it. The basic strategy, which you can get from this single image is to disaggregate the, the large body of the museum into um, effectively 55 individual rooms or spaces so that it feels something like a Medina, this is the idea, like it feels like a village or it feels like an urban settlement. Um, and then to surmount that with this great dome, I think it's 88 meters in diameter, I, that figure may not be correct, um, which would serve to condition and cool um, the spaces, the interstitial spaces between the, spa the rooms, uh, the main gallery uh, spaces. So, uh, so it's really just about putting those two things together. So in some ways, it's kind of a, quite a dumb approach, but it has, I think, a serious intention in that it is trying to condition an environment in a way other, to, other than the sort of mega malls that are the norm, rather than making a huge box and then pumping cold air into it. It tries to learn from the vernacular in ways uh, to, to find a way of making more outdoor space, more conditioned space in which people can gather uh, and move. Um, I suppose the main surprise for me was how uh, effective um, that actually was. So you can see in these images, the sort of simple strategy, it's not simple strategy, it's an incredible piece of engineering to, that goes into this dome. He's working with Bureau Happold. Here he is explaining how it all goes. Um, so the dome above, the Medina below. Um, and then within that, then, like the, the deal with the Louvre is that they have access to huge amounts of their collection. And at the same time, the Sheik was doing a serious buying spree of all kinds of artifacts from all over the world and bringing them together into this collection. So the other element of this is there is a quite extraordinary collection of stuff inside of these rooms. Uh, really kind of mind blowing. And the way in which it's put together and curated is also kind of remarkable. I need to already watch my time. Um, so this is how the building presents itself, not how we approached it. This is how it presents itself. And notable as well that in contrast to the sort of tall towers and the sort of shouting for attention um, <clears throat> projects all around, it actually is relatively modest, relatively low lying, I think 30 meters in height, it's its highest point. Uh, and it's a relatively unassuming form. And then this is how it presents itself. Um, so around its edge, you can kind of, kind of get the en engineered rim, if you like, of the, um, of the dome. Uh, and then the distance, you can see the sort of remnants of, of industry that are still ringing at the Gulf at this point. And then in the main body of it, this is the sort of impact of it. I mean, this is obviously you'd reference back, particularly to the Institut du Monde Arabe uh, from Nouvelle back in the late 80s, I think that project, maybe early 90s. Um, and, and so he, what he's doing is he's making about eight layers um, of, of these octagonally shaped metal, metal pieces to kind of filter and control the light. His phrase for this was a rain of light was what he wanted to make. And he wanted to modulate the amount of light that would come in at various points 
uh, in the plan. And this is all obviously conditioned with outdoor space and you're walking between these stone clad um, <clears throat> museum volumes. And the point is actually you can walk in and go into a cafe or you can just hang out without actually engaging with the uh, exhibits uh, at all. So it has some quality. It is controlled space, obviously. And of course, I'm conscious of all the, you know, the, 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 this is a, a piece of spectacle. This is sort of global finance, um, you know, making available culture on a very, um, uh, what do you say, um, engineered uh, kind of basis. But at the same time, I suppose what I was struck by was the, the, the sort of having come out of the sort of air conditioned world of the malls and towers was that there was something uh, pleasant and public about and sort of convivial about the spaces that were being made underneath this dome. And yes, something spectacular about them as well in terms of the way the light filtered through um, the dome. So I suppose what I was, I mean, <clears throat> and, and I'm of course also full of people taking photographs of themselves or of the roof or of themselves under the roof. So a building that's made to perform in the age of Instagram and the age of the selfie and so on and so forth. A building that's conscious of its own spectacular qualities, um, but at the same time somehow transcending them or somehow those qualities ha have real, um, have real um, force and, and phenomenal uh, presence. I'm just going to jump through. This is the interior. This is an Ai Weiwei crystal version of Tatlin's tower, sort of maybe a sort of typical product of this was something that was specially commissioned. So each of the boxes then sits, some of them sit underneath that dome, some sit without it, and, and each then has conditioned roof light depending uh, on, you know, the conditions that are needed inside that particular piece of the exhibition. And the curating of the exhibition, they're not, it's not done, it's kind of a story of human civilization sort of approach to um, curating, but the putting together of the objects, often from different locations, from different parts of the world. And of course, what's interesting, among other things, is that a lot of the holdings of the Louvre are taken from the kind of regions of the UAE and its surroundings, particularly Egypt, I guess. So you're actually seeing a lot of objects uh, back in their original <laughs> setting in a funny way, even though they're now sitting there under the rubric or under the uh, name uh, of the Louvre. Um, so the objects though, are, I mean, I'm just my own response to them very inexpertly was that they were beautifully uh, mounted and displayed and the light was just extraordinary uh, throughout, you know, so that everything was kind of brought into relief. It's one of those museums that's just pleasurable to go through because you you come across, across sometimes quite small things that are just beautifully set, you know, and 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 yes, and they have a lack of context, and yes, there's difficulties with that, um, but there are also pleasures to be gotten from them. And I did think as well, like what an addition to the pleasure available to the residents of this place that you could come here um, and you could be in this kind of environment. This is, I can't remember the name of this artist, but this is a great piece, which is these huge communal cooking pans that they use to cook rice um, mounted on a wall, just a lovely thing. Anyway, all kinds of lovely things. And back out into this and then at, and then at its edges the water then begins to ingress beneath the dome as well so you get this meeting of water stone <coughs> and then um <coughs> the sort of gridded dome above and this is the sort of moment of peak spectacle you might say uh i guess in the whole th whole thing so as i say a building in which the sort of forces at work <laughs> in the forces of contemporary capital and contemporary global production are clearly all at work. And yet somehow, something has, and I'm not a huge fan of Nouvelle's work, you know, in general, but somehow he managed to um, manipulate all of those forces into this form which, which, which was capable of giving real pleasure. It's interesting if you read, the, I went back and read some of the critical responses to this when it opened, it was 2017 when it opened. Um, but there is this slight, same, everyone is sort of won over by the thing, but they're also feeling slightly uncomfortable about the fact that they're won over by it. And I suppose that in a way was my own response as well. So that's number one. And then this is the other side of the world or somewhere far away. Uh, this is a visit I made uh, in November of last year, possibly 
one of the fine last times I got to go outside of the country, you know, and, and like what are the chances? You, last time you get to go outside of the country, you choose to go to Des Moines, Iowa. Um, you know, uh, if I thought about it, I probably wouldn't have. So I had to, I had to, as you do, go to Des Moines uh, because I was, I was due to visit a couple of buildings in Iowa City in the University of uh, I, Iowa. That was the pretext for being there. And then actually to visit another building. These are all buildings by Stephen Hall. Uh, there's another building of his in Kansas City that I was going to go down to as well. You can see on the map. So Des Moines is like at the sort of fulcrum uh, of this journey that I had to make. Uh, no doubt many, many, many of you have been to Des Moines probably many times. One of the great, great, great pleasures, I'm not going to talk about it, but I was really glad en route to those buildings in Iowa City to see one of these Louis Sullivan uh, banks. Uh, so I'm just saying that, that I've seen one of them and I bet most of you haven't, you know, so bully for me. Um, this is a great um, building, but this is so you get a like typical day. I mean, it's one of those days that sometimes you have if you're driving around in, in the US, like you, you get in late at night and you get up really early in the morning because you're jet lagged. <clears throat> and then you can just drive. Um, and it, at that stage, there was a little bit of snow on the ground, kind of cold. <clears throat> so this is very early in the morning in Grinnell, Iowa, looking at a Sullivan building. And then a really fantastic thing um, just to come across. And then I, I visited these two buildings, both very good um, in the university. Uh, both by Stephen Hall for uh, buildings for art and architecture. Because Martin Cox is on this call, I think, or he was, um, I thought I should put this in because I saw our very own graduate Martin Cox sitting there with Stephen Hall because Martin was the project architect, I think, on this project, um, first of two buildings that <coughs> Hall did in the university. So I, I had a very nice tour around this building and then the more recent building that Stephen Hall has done there, also interesting. Um, and then I hot-tailed it back to Des Moines just as the sun uh, was setting. Um, and as I was driving through Des Moines, as you do, I came across this project en route on the road, which is the David Chipperfield Library. You know, who knew David Chipperfield active in, and then down the road, a Renzo Piano um, office building again. The Des Moines, by the way, as many of you I'm sure know, is the insurance capital of uh, the United States and probably the third biggest a conglomeration of insurance companies in the world. So I was interested in where the money comes from in Des Moines. So that's where, that's now certainly where it comes from. I think there was probably big agriculture behind it in the past. But the place that I was really wanting to go to was this, the Des Moines <coughs> um, uh, Art Centre. Um, this was a building that, uh, in, is, it was built in three phases. So the earliest phase, the thing you're seeing here, and these are not my images, these, these couple of images, because it was dark by the time I got there. These were, um, this, the, these were by Eliel Saarinen. So this is an Eliel Saarinen kind of feel stone and, um, and cut stone building, kind of pavilion, built in the 1940s. I should know the date of it, but I, I, I can't quite recall. Um, and that was, as I say, the first phase of this building, um, relatively modest, but an extraordinary collection actually inside it. And these are the kind of spaces that Saarinen made, these very graceful um, kind of stone, uh, stone floored, timber lined and these beautiful uh, sinuous curved uh, ceilings um, above. And then uh, somewhat at the other end of the story, and I'm not going to talk about it, this Richard Meyer edition from the mid 80s. Um, all I can say about that is I quite liked the lift, um, which, you know, but um, the piece that really caught my attention and, and I had been told that it was really good and I would have to concur was the piece that, sorry, the pieces that first caught my attention were the collection, which is, includes some just extraordinary uh, pieces, this Edward Hopper. And because it's quite small, of course, you know the way in smaller museums, sometimes you just really get bound up in these particular pieces. That They've got this fantastic sergeant uh, double portrait. Uh, beautiful, beautiful painting. There's a kind of funny little riff they've done on it now in the time of COVID. I took this from their website, you know, properly socially distant. Um, but then a, a, a little Francis Bacon, you turn around the corner and there's a screaming Pope. Um, and this is great when you visit these museums, you know, like after hours kind of thing, and you just come across these great pieces, great du buffet. Um, that's a fantastic painting. This is by, um, what's his name? Ben Shan, right, of the Supreme Court. You know, just sort of timely maybe at the moment, but just a beautiful thing. Anyway, the piece that I was really taken by was the second edition. So you can see on this drawing, this is a Richard Meyer drawing actually, um, 
the Saarinen piece is the L shape on the left. The Meyer is the bit sort of on the bottom right. And then this bit at the top is I M Pei's edition, which dates from between 1966 and 1968. And the I M Pei edition, basically, sorry, to explain what it's doing, is it the brief was to add larger volume galleries, particularly sculpture, large scale sculpture, and also to try to provide a larger auditorium. And I, you know, it's tell, it tells you something about the relative lack of attention to pay that I couldn't find online or in our library um, drawings of this building. Um, so this is the only plan I have. I don't have a section. I, I think I have a lead now where I can get a section, but too late for today's talk. That's my next mission. But just to say that the ground slopes up uh, away as you move up to the top of this plan. In other words, this greater uh, volume up at the bottom of the plan. This allows him to slip in an auditorium under the, I can't use my cursor, but under the sort of front part of that volume. So it's basically a double volume. You'll see it when I come to the images in a minute. So it presents itself as, it's basically a large two-part hall. Um, and then it's got this kind of butterfly roof over the first part of the route you can see. So it's, it's bush hammered concrete and then stone floor. So the bush hammer concrete is supposed to be speaking to the field stone. And then the, um, you know, the, the stone floor is providing some kind of uh, continuum. And those two materials together sort of sit throughout. So you come into this space, then this is the first part of the space. And this, you've got a butterfly. I'm visiting it in, in the dark in November. So my experience of it is, 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 is a particular kind of experience. And a lot of actually the work of this building is to bring daylight in a particular way. But it's kind of interesting sometimes when you come across something. And this was, of course, it was almost empty. It was kind of sepulchral, but it was just an amazing um, use of structure to create space. I was thinking about it, that it was kind of, that, that what's masterful about it, and you'll see it as you kind of come through it, is the way that it, it as I say, deploys structure in the service of making available um, space um, and also the space is, is works superbly well in terms of the job that it was given which is the display particularly of large-scale pieces and particularly large-scale sculpture I think these are Richard Archfager pieces in the middle um, I'm pretty sure um, but you can see the butterfly roof just appearing above and then as you move this is the second part of that volume so off to the side on the butterfly roof as I say the ground goes down there's this big window out to a garden beyond, and there's this huge Sol LeWitt wall piece, which is just fantastic uh, on one wall, a great stair dropping you down to a lower floor. You can see the window there and the manipulation of the window. So some of the part of the window sits very flush to the interior. And then the, you've got this deep push of the window out to the landscape beyond. And then you're just starting to see, and again, another fantastic piece of, um, you wouldn't necessarily recognize it, but Roy Lichtenstein, is, is, is did these pyramids that you see on the other wall. And then there's this small gallery reached by a spiral stair that cuts back across um, that volume. And, and you can feel that, you know, the presence of structure always very, very clearly delineated in the way that Pai was doing at this time. This is before the National Gallery in Washington, but you can feel some of the thinking that goes into that project, actually in a way, more interestingly maybe at this point, and then just really beautifully made, the thing is, it's just, uh, just, just concrete and stone, really, and glass. The soul it is, and a handrail. Um, and then, and, and particularly I like this, the way that space reveals itself as you move through it. So as you move up onto this gallery, and then you again, suddenly you get this view back down onto the lower space you've been from, you're looking back across, um, and, and, and then I, I particularly like, as I say, I visit, oh, Steph looks like he's about to start accompanying me on guitar. No? No? Okay, that would have been good. Um, but uh, the, uh, you can see, because it's dark outside, I just really like the presence of these uh, windows as black voids, almost, um, in the plan. Just, this just gives you a sense of the making of the thing with this kind of sawn-off concrete top and then the stair, the the stone steps sitting inside it. And there's that blackness. So you see a Clifford still in the background there again. The fantastic art. This is the Liechtenstein. Just what a thing, you know. Um, there's a Frank Stella down below it, I think, which I don't think I have an image of. And there's the concrete butterfly roof. You can see I'm, <clears throat> I'm 
talking really coherently about this place, but it was, and, and this is as close as I could get to my glimpse of the slightly snowy exterior. So I did, I decided I would cheat and show you what it looks like um, in, in broad daylight if I ever get back. So this is us now looking back from the outside at that window with the stair you see off to the left. And you can just start to see the butterfly roof above. And this is the other side where there's a courtyard made. Um, I've just run out a little bit over time, but courtyard made uh, with the Saarinen project. Um, and then just by way of reference, because somebody's going to bring it up, this is around the same time as he made this project, which people may know, which is the uh, Johnson Museum in Cornell, which is another amazing place if you ever had a chance to visit it, where he makes this tower. And particularly the galleries up at the top of that, these are the, the windows that he makes there. He has, some, he has extraordinary precision. What's actually extraordinary about it is the kind of, it's really robust, large scale pieces of stone and concrete, but incredible refinement of dimension and like real and just incredible modeling of, of, of real depth, do you know? Um, uh, so I suppose I'm just really surprised by the fact that at the moment there's two books about pay three one in french in our library there's no um I, there's a couple of journal articles from the time nothing more recent um and uh, on a building uh of this quality you know it just really shocked me and, and actually there's something great about when you come to a city in the middle of nowhere that you know nothing about with no expectations at all and you find yourself stumbling uh, into somewhere like this, you know. Um, it actually sometimes just makes you, it actually, this got me excited about architecture again, I have to say, you know. Actually, at the end of a long day, um, and there was more to come on this journey, but but at, at, as things stood at eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the evening after a long day, um, this was as good as it gets. Okay, I'll stop there. Now, Kevin Roach, yeah. It would be the same, Shane, wouldn't it? Shane, do you know, maybe Shane, you know everything about um, architecture. Do you know if people have, you know, written more about pay? Or are you surprised that it's less well-known than it should be, if you don't mind? Yes, Hugh, I, I, I am, if you can hear me. Yeah, can hear yes. you. Yeah, I, I am surprised. Um, and I, I, I just wonder, you know, there, there are two factors that come in. One, you know, he was a minority architect, minority ethnic architect, and that may have had something to do with it. I don't know. Although he was, he was like a very well, very well educated and very well respected and everything. Um, but yes, I mean, all, all that generation thought he was amazing. Uh, yeah. And it is surprising that, there's, that there is uh, nothing more, particularly because like, practice passed on to his sons and, 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 and all of that. It's not like, you know, even when he got very, very old, as yeah. if he was going out of fashion, you know, there was continuity there. So that's a surprise. It was, yeah. And it sort of made me look again at things like the Louvre, you know, which I wouldn't really have a lot of love for, but as a sort of intelligent, because the other thing about that building is as an intelligent response to a site and a, and a set of functional demands, like it's just really, tightly considered is really thought through very sophisticated and probably the louvre has a bit of that as well doesn't it like it solves a lot of problems very uh, succinctly uh, yes and, and even then the very late work in out in the in the in the middle east i can't remember what the name of that museum is yeah. but again it's that it's that uncanny kind of knack like um a very strange scale of big big elements plopped yeah. down but as you say with huge sophistication and with uh, with uh, great craftsmanship attached to them, you know? I mean, they're not crude, which they should be for the size that they are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Can I just make other... a comment, Hugh? Yeah. Sorry, just, um, this is, um, I suppose, a, it's kind of a question, I suppose, in terms of, you know, these sort of spaces that, that are like a bomb or a sort of an oasis, you know, some art galleries are like train stations, some art galleries and museums are like, <clears throat> they're like temples and you just want to be there. And I was just wondering about your, you know, your own emotive response because you, you described that at the beginning. Um, and you know, once beyond the artwork, yeah. you know, what makes you linger in, 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 in a gallery or a museum for you personally? I sort of think it's that sense of you are in, uh, now this sounds uh, 
ground, but you're in harmony with it in some way. In other words, do you feel that you, you are in scale with it? And I'm actually thinking of both those places now. There's something in the consideration. In one case, it's a very, very large thing, and in the other, it's, it's much more, it's much smaller in scale. But somehow you are, I mean, I think of the Hugh Lane in Dublin as having that kind of quality, you know, that the pieces, the pieces feel very harmonious with each other and therefore with you. Mm. collections something about that i mean it's interesting i didn't go into the comparison with meyer richard meyer somehow managed to build more and make no space at all <laughs> kind of amazing. there's none it's just like gestures and um do you know what i mean moves yeah and somehow the idea that his job is to make space for people to be in and look at art just doesn't doesn't it's not on the agenda I think the in the IMP, just from the images that you show as well, it, it, it reminds me, you know, I suppose of the, as, as Emma Galise mentioned, the obviously that period of the Douglas Hyde, but mm -hmm. also the museums that were built in, in, in Tel Aviv in Israel, um, and very similar um, forms, very similar material, but this sort of broken enfilade of spaces where you're constantly being manipulated into another space rather than a long corridor um, in the French way. It's yeah. just these little clues that you're always getting to go into another space. And That's you don't really care what's in there in terms of artwork. You just want to be in that next space. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I did, I mean, in those spaces, I found it very difficult to leave, I have to say, because they were just <laughs> rich, you know, just in terms of like a sequence, the sequence yeah. was so good in them. And, and there was some, something else about that period, of course, because like, it's a period probably of peak American prosperity, you know, you would say late 60s. Well, just beginning maybe to go, but, but there's money in the Midwestern city, you know, to make, it, make something of that uh, quality. I mean, that shouldn't be surprising, but just, um, and, and that feeling of then there's also the collection in behind it, you know, that can inhabit it and so on and so forth. So it is, you know, I think you do see a lot of museums across, again, that would be a really interesting book to talk about. Yeah. That, that yeah. period of museum building and, and how it happens and who the patrons are, you know, and this sort of belief. I mean, there has been written stuff written about it in relation to Cold War, hasn't there, about the kind of the leveraging of art, you know, as part of an American identity to counter the Soviets. I mean, I'm sure that's nothing to do with this, but just that period of investment, if you like. Mm. Is, is sort of interesting.